Hello everyone, David here with some thoughts about the wonderful story of Jacob's Ladder. Now it's a really familiar story of course and it has its background, its genesis in the promise that God gives to Abraham. That Abraham and his family will be a blessing to the whole earth. And that promise moves through the family. It's how it has its outworking. It cascades down the generations. And so Isaac uh, embodies that promise himself. And then his two sons, Esau and Jacob, his two twin sons, uh, not identical, of course, they're the next generation to take the promise on. And that's where it all goes wrong. And in this story, and in this moment, it looks as though it's going to be impossible to move forward with God's promise because Jacob has deceived his father Isaac. Isaac is old, his sight's not good, and Jacob's elder twin Esau, by right, deserves Jacob's blessing and inheritance. And of course, as we know, at the instigation of his mum, Rebecca, Jacob tricks Isaac into giving him the blessing instead. And when this all comes to light, Esau, his brother, is absolutely furious and promises to get revenge, promises to kill Jacob. And so Jacob is sent off by his mum and his dad to go and find a wife in Haran. And that's where we join the story. So there's been epic deceit, there's been a complete failure on Jacob's part to uphold the morality that God wants. And as he makes this journey, we join him at the end of the first day. And you wonder what's going through his mind. So many things, you think, as he lays down to sleep. Uh, he's not got a tent, he's not even got a bedroll. He takes a stone from the side of where he is, just picks it up, puts it down and puts his head on it and that's his pillow. And it's a really bleak moment. And as he goes to sleep, you can imagine all the sorts of fears and anxieties that are playing on his mind, uh, as they would play on ours. He's probably welcomed sleep and dreads the morning, dreads waking up to have to face who he is and what he's done and the implications of all of that. So the story, we join it at this pivotal moment, not just for Jacob, but for God's promise and God's intention. And it seems to me that God intervenes. God speaks into the heart of Jacob's fear and his dread, into the heart of his dislocation and disconnection from his own family and from God's promise and from all that his grandfather Abraham stands for and was hoping to achieve the blessing of all nations. God speaks into that in a dream. Now, you could argue that this is just Jacob's psyche wrestling and putting things together, um, but I don't think that's right. I think in this moment of his lostness, God takes the initiative and God reaches out to Jacob in this dream because the dream speaks right into his fears. So Jacob fears himself to be disconnected, lost, and he has this vision of a ladder of light reaching up and down from heaven to where he is. And angels of God going up and down all the time, continually. I think that's a really beautiful image because it speaks right into God's response. What God wants Jacob to know is that he's still with him, would never leave him, and that... God's purpose is still at work. The angels coming and going up and down from heaven to earth. God's purpose is vibrant and alive. And what's more, it's right there where he is sleeping. And so Jacob wakes up. And it's that moment of waking when we put things together in our own minds, when our imaginations are particularly open, I think, that we now find him putting two and two together and making sense of his dream and doing it powerfully. Because he exclaims that, 
God is in this place and I didn't know it. And that begs all sorts of questions about, well, what place are we talking about? Because this is more than just a lesson in geography. Yes, he has discovered that in this place of dislocation, actually, God is there. God is everywhere. God is at work. God's purpose embraces and surrounds us. But it's more than that. In this place, I think, also points to his inner identity of who he is at the very core of his being. And Jacob is saying to himself, echoing God's dream, promise to him that God is there at the very core of his being too. God has not left him, even though Jacob has walked away. The place he's gone to in his shame and killed, God is reaching down right there too. So it's an epic story of hope and of identity. God reaffirms Jacob's identity, reaffirms the promise working through from his grandfather and his father, cascading down the generations to him. He's not lost it. God doesn't give up on Jacob and he doesn't give up on us either. God is intentionally, in this moment of great peril, reaching deep into Jacob's soul to waken him, to aliven him, to energise him once more, to step forward on the pathway of hope and promise. That matters more than anything to Jacob, and it's the gift God gives him. So let's examine this as we look at the text. What Jacob needs to hear uh, is fascinating because as we see what God says to him, we'll unpack that very need. And the first thing is really important. God says, I am the Lord. So let's just think about that. In the midst of all the turmoil and all the trouble that he's in, one thing he needs to know, that God has the situation in hand and that God is God. I am the Lord, says God to Jacob in the dream. And that's the most important statement of all, I think, is that we're, Jacob is putting all of himself into God's hands in this dream. At least God is encouraging him to see himself held by God who is the Lord, the God of creation, of everything that is, as the Bible says to us. God is the God in whom we live and move and have our being. And the most important thing is that Jacob holds on to that fact, that God is God. And that's true for all of us too. Naturally enough, of course, in this time of lockdown, we just need to trust that God is God. God is the Lord. Remember that fact and hold to that rock. And then God reminds Jacob of the promise. He says, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. That's important too. The promise is in a line unbroken to him and he needs to hold fast to that, that God is being faithful to God's promise. Then God says, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Well, that's just outrageous, outlandish. What a wonderful way to reassure Jacob. Here God is actually helping him to see the very ground he's on. He's part of the promise and will be part of the gift that God will give to him. He can't see that, of course, can Jacob. He can't see much of anything, I guess, in his fear and his shame. Here he is in the dream. Not only is he reminded that God is God and that the promise is real through the generations to him, God is faithful and God is going to give the gift of land, not only to him, but to his offspring. The promise through the generations assured. And God emphasises this and says, Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. This wonderful abundance of promise and hope spreads out to encompass the known world. And all of this 
through deceitful, hopeless Jacob, asleep in his fear. God reopens his imagination, his heart and his mind in this dream to everything that God is, the immensity, the magnitude, the power and the beauty of God's love. And that's what God wants you and me to hold on to, the immensity of all of that in Jesus, our Saviour, who died and is risen, uh, that we would inherit this promise, the wonder of grace itself, through us to the whole world. And that's why, here in this text, what Jacob hears is the essential gospel. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. There it is. There is the task. There is the promise that this isn't just about Jacob. It's about mission in the most wonderful sense imaginable that Jacob, broken, humiliated Jacob, is going to be the one in whom and through whom God's blessing will become real for those who need it. So in these first five verses, we have the essence of the gospel for this broken person. And we have the essence of the gospel in Jesus for you, for me, for everyone, forever. And then God makes some really important statements to Jacob. Know that I am with you. Just think about that. Know that I am with you. You may not think you deserve it, but I am always. Wherever you go, I shall be there. That's what the, the ladder and the angels is saying to Jacob's deepest need. And God reaffirms his love of Jacob. No, I'm with you. More than that, I'll keep you wherever you go. We need to hear that verse. That verse is so important to us at the moment as we struggle to come out of lockdown and to move into a very uncertain future. We need to know that Jesus is with us and that he will keep us wherever we go. And not only that, Jacob understands in this dream God saying to him, I will bring you back to this land coming back to where the promise began, coming back to his inheritance, coming back to God's gift, that even though he's having to go away, God is already planning on bringing him back. And that's what God is doing with us and our church, planning to bring us back for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you, says God to Jacob. I won't leave you. I am with you. I will keep you. And all of that being true until I've done what I promised you. And for us, that promise is that God in Christ will take us into the family in heaven in glory. So let's just think about this a little more. This sense of disconnection and lostness and separateness that God is speaking into as Jacob dreams. The predicament is quite sparse for him. Now in this photograph, which I took at St Hilda's Priory, um, there is a profound sense of bafflement, at least for me, because if you can see a way to get into that door, you're a better one than I am. There is no way up. There is no way in. You've got this little room with a door, window the other side, but no way of getting in there. And to all those who feel like that in their relationship with God, to all those who feel cut off, to those who wouldn't even want to go up a ladder if there was one there, God is saying, look, I am with you. I'm not stuck separate. We are not apart. I'm always there. I'm always reaching out. I have a plan and a promise for you. Believe and have hope. This is one of my favourite sculptures ever, I think. It's a beautiful sculpture. 
uh, which was at uh, Wydale Hall, the Diocesan Retreat Centre. And on the right, you can see a tree which has been lopped down, um, brutalised, um, and they were wondering what to do with it. And so they got a, a really fantastic sculptor called uh, Colin. He came in and he made Jacob's Ladder out of, out of this tree that was otherwise going to be felled. And on the left-hand side of the image you can see what it looked like when it was new. What a transformation. At the bottom you can see the stone, the pillar, and then there carved into the tree is this wonderful ladder climbing up and there is an open door and a space at the top. What a wonderful evocation of this dream and this promise that wherever we are, we are in touch with God and the fulfilment of the gospel. But of course, the tree didn't last. Like anything organic, uh, it rotted away. And many years later, when I went to Wydale, this was all I could find of it. On the left-hand side, you can see what's left of that particular top part. You can see the little ladder, uh, the remains of the arch, the doorway has long gone. That's all there was. And a real sense of sadness looking at that. A real sense of loss. And maybe that's how many of us feel as we look at what we once had as church and how we worshipped and as we try and take all of that on board and look to the future it all seems so far away so difficult to return to but jacob as he slept had his fears met by god's overwhelming love and grace and presence and in Jose de Ribera's painting, 17th century painting, you can see him asleep with all his anxiety. And there in light and majesty are the angels coming up and coming down. So no matter what we think has gone, no matter what we think won't be the same ever again, God is reaching out to us and holding us with promise and with purpose. And here is Turner's attempt to portray the same story with a lot of artistic and biblical license, I would say, because Jacob isn't on his own in the left part of the picture. He's with his family. Um, it makes for a better image, I guess. But the glory of Turner's image is fantastic. These angels coming and descending and rising and an angel, uh, the Lord there as well, um, conversing with Jacob, who's got a smile on his face, so far as I can see. A wonderful evocation of a moment of precious connection, showing that nothing is ever lost to us. The one in whom we live and move and have our being is the one in whom all things are held for eternity. So what is God saying to us as we dream? What is God saying into our anxieties as we look ahead? What is the promise that God wants us to make real as a church? Well, this image is part of the memorial to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the American president in Washington. It evokes for us uh, his New Deal. It is an evocation too of the Great Depression. On the left hand side is depicted rural poverty with uh, an elderly couple. On the right you've got five figures queuing in an urban street outside a door. Presumably they are queuing up either for food or for a handout. But there is a stark reminder of the context of suffering and struggle and loss and uncertainty in which the gospel always comes alive. A third of a nation, ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished, was the context of the Great Depression. And I think Roosevelt's words speak into our own context as we look to the future and the recession that is fast becoming a reality and the huge unemployment that is going to be the lot of far too many people. 
The test of our progress, says Roosevelt, is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. And that's the test of our society. And that's the test of our faith. And that's at the very heart of the promise God gives to Jacob. Because God's people are always intended to be a blessing for everyone. To share the bounty of God's creation with one another, with everyone. And so that is a big question, I think, for all of us as church. Not just how do we get back to our building, but how do we reach out and into the huge social and economic needs that are getting ever more acute as each day continues. So this story of Jacob has within it all the elements of the gospel. It has a God who reaches out in grace and love and passion and power to remind us that God is the God of creation, that Jesus is Lord. It reminds us that we're not lost and disconnected, but we're always part of God's promise and purpose, that God always loves us, and through us God reaches out to bless those who desperately need to be blessed. And that God won't let anything get in the way of that purpose and that promise. And because God knows what we're like, God says, I am with you and I'll walk with you and I'll stay with you and I will be with you through it all until the promise has come true. So in this time of challenge, as we are struggling to come out of lockdown, as we are really perplexed about how to do church in new ways, about what it means to be so compromised in the use of our building, everything that is unfamiliar, I think there are real echoes here of Jacob's experience. We are making a journey we don't want to make. We're going away from what we know, from what gives us security and comfort. And we're journeying towards a destination which is very unclear. But what is true is that we're journeying within the promise, within the promise God makes real in Jesus who is our Lord, who is here, who does reach out to us, who is present and in the power of whose spirit we know that we belong and that there is hope for there is nothing that love cannot face. So for us, the challenge is to make the promise real. It's to let God speak into those deep fears that we have in the same way that he spoke into Jacob's deepest and darkest fears as he dreamt. And the fact it's a dream, I think, encourages us because it's in that place of dream space possibility that God can break through and birth new possibility in a way that which, if we're fully awake and present to our fears, I think it's much more difficult for God to do that and for us to be aware of it. The really crucial thing is that Jacob marks this moment of revelation and hope and new life in God by putting up a pillar. He takes his, his pillow and makes it into a pillar and he consecrates it. He anoints it with oil. It's a marker. It's like a trig point in the landscape. It lets you know where you are. You can get your bearings from it. It's really important to say here at this time and this place, God met me. And what I'd like to suggest is perhaps it's going to be really helpful for us as we go forward to be mindful of those moments when God has reached out to us and reaffirmed us, held us, touched us with grace, brought us alive in Jesus, filled us with the Spirit. Those key moments on our journey, let's be mindful of them as we look back because they will encourage us as we look forward. So why don't we just take some time to reflect, to think back about the people and the times and the places that are our significant markers of faith. 
and let God speak reassuringly to us through those memories in the hope that what God is now doing is reaching out to us, speaking into our uncertainty and our fear and wanting us to find a new pathway, a new way forward, as yet unclear, but we know that wherever we are and whatever we are going through, God is there. That wonderful ladder of God's presence in Jesus is our truth. Jesus will never ever desert us. Wherever we are, he is, and he consecrates that place with the glory of God. So even though we can't be together in the way that we want, God is with each of us and in God's presence we know that belonging and that togetherness. And it's that belonging and togetherness that's at the heart of our sharing of bread and of wine. We remember, we look back to that significant moment when Jesus broke bread and shared wine the night before he was executed. And it's a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, of his risen presence as we take bread and wine. He is with us. He reminds us, literally reminds our thinking and our dreaming with the beauty of God's love and God's hope. So we will join together and we will share in bread and wine and we will remember whose presence is with us and who will never ever desert us but will always want to bring us to that pathway of grace and hope which takes us into the very heart of the world's need. God bless. <laughs>